In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to build, prepare, pin and glue Forge World, all of the assembly, and also how to convert this rogue iron love more. All right, so welcome to another Artist Sabers video. We have this junky chappy in today's video. This is a fairly heavily converted and reposed rogue iron love mock. But the main subject of the video is how to deal with Forge World, which is somewhat of a kind of a an unknown subject for a lot of people. I've chosen the Rogue Idol because it's quite beginner friendly, so we're gonna be covering uh, washing. Yes, you do have to put your Forge World in a bath. Uh, <laughs> as weird as that is, I'll explain why later. Um, pinning, which uh, again, a couple of people may not be not be familiar with, but it's a really useful technique. Gluing, assembly, and then also the midsection of the video covers my conversion on the model, and then the last third is how I went about painting it. So all of that is covered in the video. We've got some timestamps, so use them, skip to whichever bit is the most relevant for you, they're there for your convenience. And please give the video a like if you like it, please comment, please subscribe, let us know what you'd like to see next. And if you want to stick around till the end, I'll be giving some additional information about my thoughts on the build and painting process there as well. I'm not sure if many of you will know this, but a lot of models from Forge World, uh, all models from Forge World, because they're resin, they've been made with mold release agent on them. So mold release agent is there to help things exit the molds when they're made of resin, but it is a lubricant. So you don't want it on your model before you prime it because it will make it far easier for your primer to leave. So I've just got some washing up liquid here. It doesn't matter what brand it is, an old toothbrush that I use for stripping models. And then I'm putting the model in hot water, uh, like quite hot because that will make it dry better. And I think it gives you a better clean. But um, one thing to be aware of is perhaps if you're using thin bits of forge world stuff like panels, don't put it in water as it's too hot because it could actually warp. So I'm just giving this a scrub with a fairy liquid. I've left the tags on at this stage because it's convenient because I can just leave it to dry like that. And uh, everything's going to get a scrub, a little bit of a bath, and we'll leave them to dry and then come back to it. Okay, so you've cleaned your models. They've dried fully, which is pretty important. You can hair dry them. Like I said, be careful with heat if it's a thin piece like a panel or something like that. Otherwise, I mean, I've got a particularly chunky one here, so I really don't need to worry. And then just clip them off as close as possible. Uh, to the model without going into the details and then again I've got a pretty forgiving one here so what I'm going to be doing is just removing details and then doing my best to kind of counter out whether it's with a bit of sculpting or kind of some creative hacking away because if it's a big line running down something you can get rid of a bit here a bit here you can use uh, sandpaper to sand it off just get rid of it if it's pretty light or you can go in there like wholesale with a knife and kind of pair it off or scrape it down or whatever is needed. I thought I would show you uh, a way to deal with the flat sections that you can create by scraping these seal lines off. A couple of things, first of all, um, if you're in doubt on where the seal lines are and you're looking to fold it around the model, they always follow from the pillars. So this pillar and this pillar in this direction, therefore the seal line is gonna go all the way around like that. Uh, so if you lose them, that's just a useful way to get hold of them. Now I've kind of chased this one along here and I've made a flat section there. Now a couple of things you can do, you can hack into it carefully with your brush. Now obviously this is a, a stone rubbly model quite forgiving so I hack into it and then scrape off any sharp edges. You can use a mold line remover and you can just kind of scrape into it at random. <clears throat> and another thing you can do is you can get a pin vise with different sizes of drill bits is probably a good idea. I've just got a kind of a, a normal one millimeter one here and then you can use that to make kind of a pockmarked surface. There. The other thing you can do obviously is you can put a little bit of green stuff on there and uh, press into that with a modeling tool or something similar, but um, I'm just looking to kind of make a regular shapes here. Uh, anything you want, you can use to make pock marks in. If you've got an older blade that snaps for a little, you can put it in and twist it around. And you can do that uh, like the pin vise, uh, and then you can even go into that shape, carefully work your way around. This is a similar way to how you make bullet holes and do that. But whatever you're doing, you're just looking to break up any, if there has been a line down here, a really good way to distract attention from it, even if you can't get it in the recesses, is to do a couple of lines dissecting it and just break it up. And especially given that we're gonna be dry brushing this bad boy, uh, all of this should kind of disappear into the background and general busyness of the model. 
we are onto the assembly now and uh, we are going to be pinning. So pinning, if you, if you are not aware, involves taking a bit of paper clip or brass rod or something like that, a pin vise or a drill, you can use a Dremel if you've got one to hand, making yourself a initial hole in one side. I usually tend to do this on the deeper side of the model and make a pilot here. And I've got a, uh, a technique that I think is really, really useful for this. So put in your paper clip, then what you need to do is chop it off. If you can make it spiky, do. And by that, I mean chop it off, leaving the flat side um, outwards, not inwards. So you're, you're making it spiky. Obviously, be careful with this later when you're touching it. So you chop it off spiky. And then the bit that you want to be attaching, you can put some green stuff in this, a little flat section of it to make it easier, or some blue tack or something like that. Basically, take it press it really hard, obviously don't do this on something thin that it's going to pierce through or something like that. Once you've done that, I cannot put my pin in the wrong place now. Hopefully that's nice and obvious on camera. So at this point, I can simply get this. And the only thing you have to be mindful of is you want to be drilling at the same angle as your piece. So if this, if this was coming like here, you want to glue at that angle. If it's going straight out, you glue this way. So do bear in mind the kind of angle of the leg here or just the rest of the model in general. But now you've got a perfect place to be able to do this. Um, if it's a delicate piece, like I say, what you can do is you can make a, just make a very a thin pad of green stuff, pop that on the, uh, the inside bit, and then when you press them together, you'll be left with a, uh, an obvious indentation in the much softer green stuff. And this just makes it far easier for you to get a nice solid bond. Okay, so now you've done that, what's next is to make up some green stuff. And uh, one thing you may not be aware of with green stuff is the yellow is what makes it sticky. So if you want something to be particularly grabby and hold stuff in place, then a high proportion of the yellow can be a good idea. And uh, because you're only gluing models together here, um, I tend to chop the middle strip where they fuse together out of the way. But um, if you're doing model assembly or like making bases or whatever, it's a good opportunity to move, use up that middle strip because it doesn't particularly matter what you're doing. So give it a good mix together until you've got a nice uniform green. And the tip for this, for me, in my eyes, is to use a bit of lubrication, which can just be water, um, to your advantage. So I'll take you through the process that I generally use. So I'm going to put a bit of super glue here on one side. Now, not too much, just a little. There we go. You want to make sure that that pin is held in there. Now I'm going to take some green stuff. <laughs> and press it down here. Now I'm going to take a bit of water, dab that on top. And really press these together quite a lot. Obviously, you don't want it bulging out. You don't want to put excess green stuff there. But having used that water, hopefully, you can pull it away without ruining things irreparably. And what you see there is that kind of rough fitting joint. We've now made a perfect filling joint and a socket. So at that point, pop in a bit of your super glue on top instead of below here. And now you've got a pin, perfect socket, and hold them together for a little bit and you should be able to get a really, really strong bond there. Obviously these are heavy pieces so I'm gonna leave them to dry and we should come back to a super solid model. Now, I uh, should go without saying, but maybe it shouldn't, because I've just done it myself. It does make a lot of sense, particularly on a large, heavy, this is a very weighty model here, to do all of the pre-prep stages at the same time, because you're gonna need to hold this chunk, get good angles and get into it and drill into it and stuff like that. So uh, if you prep all of them, including their pins in, and you can super glue those pins in from one side, even, uh, it's worth prepping all of these kind of male parts um, with their pins before putting them in the female parts at the same time because I, if this was part of this now, I just end up snapping off and undoing all my good work like I have done there. So you wanna do all of your pre-prep at the same time and then pop a leg on, pop a leg on, pop an arm on, pop an arm on, and then leave it to dry like that. Okay, so because I'm a masochist, uh, I have come up with the idea of putting this guy in a slightly more lent forwards aggressive pose rather than kind of a like a comedy lent back one. So what I've done, is I've used exactly the same concepts that we spoke about to find a pinning point here. I've used a larger pin than you would do normally here. What that means is that I can 
feed one in, feed the other in, and then I can get my guy into, probably see it better from this angle here, how much space down it is, but it means I can get him into this position. And actually, because they're metal, even though they're very thin, that's a pretty strong joint there. So from there, I can kind of work out the pose, go over to the other foot, and then I don't quite know what we're gonna do with the arms, but we'll see how it goes. So hopefully you can see here what I was talking about with the other leg. So I've done the normal uh, baby pilot pin in there. I've got a pin that's slightly too long in the other leg. That gives me room to kind of uh, rotate things, get them worked out. I'm gonna press it in place. It's a short pin, so that's important. It'll give me a closer idea of exactly where it should be. Now once I'm sure, I can press into it and we get our baby guideline just there. Things don't often go right full time. This guy now has three little bullet holes on his leg because I've been trying to get the right position, but I think we are good. So basically what I wanted is for him to have one gorilla hand, a poor fist, whatever, uh, on the floor, and then one angry one in the air. So this guy is gonna look way more kind of, if I can pick it up and put it to the side, kind of like a pack dog, stanced. And again, just to show you how much uh, kind of experimentation and stuff is important, I've hacked out a large section of this just with clippers. Uh, to allow me to get closer to where I need to be join wise and then I made a pinning place in the wrong place so I've had to fudge around with it but we have worked out with a good strong bond at the pose that we're going for. See that side on, what I wanted is all three of these limbs to be in good contact with the ground and even though this guy's got his back heel raised here, the toes are firmly planted so the pose looks pretty gorilla -y pretty angry and we can cover over stuff like this with a little bit of sculpting or hacking in there and making it look a bit more organic. All that remains is to hack his neck to bits because we don't want something that's really kind of stuck out uh, projecting forwards too aggressively. Um, there's just no, no point really. Um, he, the original model, which I have to my left, painted, he's got quite a long stalk on his neck which kind of appears out of his tummy to some degree and I want this guy to be a bit more uh, well, a bit less precarious looking and a bit more kind of hulking and I don't think having a long, delicate neck is part of that. So what I've done is I've hacked all of the joining parts out from the neck and some of the side bits and that's going to allow me to kind of tilt him and also give him a direction in which he's facing. And then I, I find that if, if models aren't looking straight forward and just like, uh, like default marine, you'll notice with a lot of my space marines, they frequently have a head tilt, they're looking in a direction, they've got a place that they're looking, uh, it gives your models a lot more life. So I've hacked all of that off and he's gonna be intently looking there with his kind of his fist raised up here and it should really add a lot to the overall feel of the piece. I'm gonna be using my airbrush on some of this and the convenient thing about that is he is such a craggy boy that it's gonna allow me to get in there in the recesses uh, with a black. So here he is, he's pretty chunky, feels pretty sturdy. Um, the joints have worked out quite nicely. So let's rock on with the painting. So I'm just gonna be going in the recesses with Leo 950 Black, my kind of fan favorite and firm favorite of the channel. And this is just to fill in all of those recesses. We don't want it to be lighter in the recesses than on the raised areas at all. While we're on this, why not add some Holdra Blue in? Because it wouldn't be an AO tutorial without some Holdra Blue. And that should help it kind of remain nice and deep. The next stage is just to pick a nice neutral dark grey. I've gone for Eshin, but you could use whatever you like. You could use your favourite light grey plus black. It really genuinely doesn't matter. And this is going to be doing quite a lot of work. So um, this is going to be covering the majority of the model, basically. Now we've got a pretty chunky model here and he has some really, really angular lines on him. So what I would recommend is, basically when I airbrush, a lot of the time anyway, I don't particularly change the angle of my hand, I change the angle of the model, and this guy's a perfect recipient. So if I keep my airbrush pretty much there, and I'll do all of this with moving the model. Um, I wanna be aiming from above, like this, from 45 degrees, and then from below I'll be getting it less, but the model can let you do all of the work, especially when it's this big and this textured. I've got my airbrush on quite high pressure because he's a big boy. And I'm just going to be hitting him like this in multiple layers, um, super fast because we're airbrushing, just looking to build up that 
layer and texture of colors and I'll assess it as I go through. I can change the angles, I can hit him more. We've got a couple of lighter colors to come and then a load of dry brushing and some shading anyway. Okay, so we're just adding some Dawnstone. So this is gonna be pretty much a 50-50 mix. And again, just like the last time, we're gonna be using angles and holding of the model, not angling of the brush. It's very important, especially with a model that's got a unorthodox pose like this uh, and has been repositioned, it's really important for me that I hold in mind its actual, its actual upright angle rather than its perceived upright angle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna leave him on the texture palette and turn around like this like it's a lazy Susan. And because then I'll, I'll hold it in my hands and I'll start orienting it some way or another and actually that isn't the angle that I should be kind of imagining or projecting light from. So I'm gonna be taking my 45 degrees from here, all over, it's such a big model, it's, it's like painting a, I feel like I'm in a car workshop or something. So I'm just gonna be rotating it here, making sure he doesn't fall over, but this is gonna make sure that, like I said, there's a big difference between perceived angle and held angle it's not obvious on this. If you're holding an Imperial Knight or something, you obviously know which way is up. I've made my pile of rocks look like a gorilla. I don't know what way is up or left or down. So all of this is gonna be done while he's on his base here, generally speaking. Then I might kind of do some fine tuning afterwards, but from 45 degrees and a, a couple of the specific rocks, like maybe on the back, I might choose to do stuff slightly differently. But generally speaking, I wanna be hitting if it was a sphere, I want to be hitting it from the middle to the top, but not from the middle to the bottom. I want to keep that nice and dark. Having done that stage, we're looking pretty good. Our chunky boy has got the beginnings of kind of transitions going on. Nothing here is particularly extreme yet. It's all, it's, he's such a large model that you don't need to be pushing for contrast. And a lot of our contrast is indeed going to be coming from the dry brushing stages, which are beginning very soon after the shading. So what we're going to do here is just hit the model from above again with the Dawnstone and then we're gonna transition to one more highlight. All these stages are taking like three to five minutes. So it's a really, really quick job. Um, and then we're gonna be spending a lot more time on the actual dry brushing. Okay, so with our Dawnstone, same principles again, but I'm gonna be going from more extreme angle. So I wanna be going right from above. Obviously I said about using this as a carousel last time. Uh, I can't whilst on camera, so I'm gonna bear top facing positions in mind really well. And all of this is being hit from above. Try and get an angle that demonstrates this better. He looks ridiculous. So, got a little bit of spotting there. I'm sure we can fade that out. So just hitting the model from above. Uh, the previous step, we were going from this point to this point. This step, we're just going from this point to this point. So from like 12 o'clock to two o'clock. Um, just to give it a, a clock face uh, kind of principle. And it's a really useful thing to think of that type of stuff when you are particularly airbrushing. You can do it with stippling as well. And a lot of other, it needs to be a fast technique or you need to be a painting genius and spending 10 hours on a model. But if you're doing it with a fast technique, it's very easy to just hold something at a particular angle and then kind of let the, uh, the geometry and the shapes of the miniature do it for you. Particularly areas like this with really three dimensional chunky scoops, you're gonna get actually quite lovely blending in there as this top part isn't hit, but this bottom part is. And that's the stuff you can exaggerate if you wanna go in later with glazing and really do a kind of top end job. People are gonna tell me off for contaminating my paint. So obviously that's already quite a lot brighter. And then again, just hitting it from those above angles. And I'm gonna show you here what you can do with extreme angles, hopefully on camera, on that bit of his arm that I said I really liked the stuff on. So if I am shooting right down it, Take care with this, take your time, we're on kind of the finishing airbrush step, so it's worth really doing it carefully. You can see there what we've got in terms of those volumes and them being darker at the top. We're doing this stage, uh, and it might be worth you kind of paying attention to the individual sections of it a bit more than we were. We were just going holistically over the entire thing, but pay attention to individual sections, because what we'll do is once uh, we'll pay attention to the sections from above with a highlight, and then we're gonna do it from below with a shade and that added together will add some amazing kind of contrast to the entire piece as a whole. We're onto the shading now. I've got Holger Blue and 950 Black in here. I've also put a little bit of Flow Improver in it. Now this is a pretty dark color, so as you can see on my palette, it's capable of doing some pretty dark polka dots. So what I'm gonna be doing is using it from a fair way back from the model to kind of 
dilute the spray, so this rather than that. And I'm gonna be using aggressive angles again. So um, with darker paint, this stuff is a lot easier uh, than it is with lighter paint. So if we go to the section that we kind of started on on his arm, angle-wise, I'm gonna be really extreme. I'm coming at a, a completely acute or obtuse angle, whichever one it is, uh, someone can comment that below. But I'm gonna be going at this edge here. So hopefully you'll be able to see this kind of appearing on camera. Just darkening these edges. That's actually working really well. So there we go. You can see this starting to materialize. Exaggerate them a little further. So from here, it'll look very extreme, but when you turn it that way, you, you've just made some really nice, kind of pretty subtle, again, because it's texture-based. Be aware of overspray, like while I'm doing this, I am making this darker. Shouldn't be an issue, as long as you're always holding stuff at the right angle. But sections like this, you can see what I've done there. You can exaggerate that with a wash, with glazing, and then the dry brushing is gonna go over this, and that will work absolute wonders. As well as the undershading, I'm just gonna be doing some recess shading here, and that one's pretty simple. Uh, you can dilute your paint a little further for this if you want, but I'm just using it as a way to get in there, in the recesses, and kind of regardless of the way that they're facing, as you can see, I've already done it with this one, just get a little bit more contrast between the areas that are further back and the areas that are sticking out. And with that nicely diluted mix, it rough and ready, uh, super organic in the recesses. Now, there is a bit of thinner in here that doesn't normally matter. I diluted it quite a lot with water, but if you are ever doing something like this yourself, be aware that involving thinner there can take paint off. I'm using here what I describe as kind of two phase washing. And what that involves is doing one quick wash and then before it's dried, so we don't get any of these kind of tidal marks or anything like that, you come in with a brush that's just got water on it and you just fuzz them out. So come here, just that. Areas like this ankle and this arm, we can show it on really well. So we've got pretty much a, a flat line here where it stops. Fixed. I have whacked out the XL and the dry brushing is beginning proper. I've hair dried the model. Uh, some parts of this weathering don't look perfect, but the fact that we have kind of left the uh, the dry brushing for this stage is just gonna go to uh, towards countering that fully. So time to rock on. I'm starting with the Dawnstone here. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of our old one, work it in, and I don't want I don't want this to be brown at all. So this is why it's important to let things dry. Also, if you've got a palette like mine, make sure you don't accidentally contaminate it. Work off your excess and then into dry brushing heaven because this is basically terrain made into a model. So we're just going to be doing this all over and I'm not particularly going to be paying attention to like directions or anything like that. Um, I just want to get an, an overall effect. Obviously you can choose to do kind of undersides a little bit darker if you wish, but generally speaking I'm, uh, I'm just going to be taking the same approach all over the model and I'll incrementally uh, add I'll do once all over, add some more white, once all over, add some more white, and they'll be in a really good spot. Finishing stages, I've got some white on my palette. I just wanted to show you the type of dry brushing that I'm doing here. So I'm gonna use the dampening pad, but I don't wanna oversaturate my brush. It is an XL, so it, it drinks water pretty fast. I've been refilling that quite a lot. I've also been doing a lot of work with this, but it helps keep the brush from getting oversaturated. So taking a little bit of the pure paint here, really working off the excess, and then I'm using soft buffing. I don't wanna hit any edges too much, but I do wanna hit the edges. So holding the brush further back to reduce the pressure, make it a bit more flexible which is the opposite of what you do for stippling, for example. And this guy's being hit very gently. So let's go to a particularly important area like the face. See how little pressure I'm applying in there. You can probably hear it even. It's a very soft motion. And then I can take a little bit of white, work it in. It doesn't matter what white you're using here. It's just to kind of tint things a little bit. And again, keeping it super soft. 
that is pretty much it really as far as steps that are uh, super essential you could go in and you could green this i do that exactly the same way as we've approached the rest of the model really so like deep green base uh, with the airbrush or brush brush up to you and then dry brush of a lighter green dry brush of a lighter green plus yellow if you wanted it to be really contrasting and you've got the details there that you could paint with metallics and washes probably and you could use the same weathering with the uh the uh, rusty doom ball brown that we've used everywhere it's a complete optional step i've got a size five which is a huge one of our brushes and I've just got some holdable in water that I've made a glaze from. Literally like 10 parts water to one part holdable blue or something like that. And what I'm doing is I'm going to the sections where it's the darkest or areas where I'd like to exaggerate the shading that we've got on the model. And I'm simply pushing it up, ending my stroke at the top of these sections. So if we take the arm bit that I've been a particular fan of all the way through, just starting in the middle, I'm pushing roughly to there you've got a finger to remove any excess you can dilute this as much as you want you can mix some black in to use it to kind of uh, shade things a bit more aggressively and um, and have it less blue if you wanted to entirely up to you but it's just an extremely quick way to add some kind of manual brush level interest here and with a brush as big as a size five as well you can hit a lot of sections of the model before needing to go back to your palette it's also a great way if you push it up against the, um, the bright edge highlights that we've got from our dry brushing, you're just pushing the contrast, which is something that I never stop going on about on the channel and is a really important part of miniature painting form. Okay, so again, for comparison, we have the two chunky chappies who are completely different pose-wise now. Really pleased with how that worked out. We've got the kind of uh, the original silverback pose that I was going for with the conversion. Now for the kind of extracurricular uh, teaching section on this one, I wanted to cover a couple of things. One is in my paint job, I used the paint Dawnstone. Now, I didn't realize until kind of halfway through, Dawnstone is actually quite a warm gray. And I had I known that, I don't think I would have used it in the paint job. Uh, it looks absolutely fine, the model's super solid, but I think I could have had a crisper, cooler lo looking model, particularly that it's got the warm colours in the recesses, I think it would have been nice to, to maybe not have that in there. Uh, and you could use any neutral grey or any blue grey, I mean I've used all the Space Wolf-esque colours a lot recently, and I think that's a, kind of a recent discovery of mine in terms of my own personal taste, but it also fits a lot with the dry brushing that we do. The second thing I wanted to cover is Right, so this is our half circle, and I covered this a lot in the tutorial, but I wanted to make it a little bit more clear what I talk about using angles when painting. So this is a circle, but you could also have a similar thing if you had something more angular, whatever it was. Um, and what I'm talking about here is, so let's, let's take this and break it into four sections. If this model is the Rogue Idol, all of it is sprayed black, sprayed black, uh, all of it is sprayed black, and then the top three quarters, top 75% of it is hit with kind of the darker gray, top 50% of it and above is hit with the medium gray. And then this top section is hit with a much lighter gray. And then from the very, very top is the final step. We hit it with kind of our white gray. Now, the lovely thing about this is you're just letting the model do the work for you. That's really, really important with all of painting in general, but especially when you've got a large, chunky, angular thing um, like the Rogue Idol, it's really, really fast uh, because you're just blasting it from here, blasting it from here, blasting it from here, blasting it from here. And then you put down this wonderful foundation that kind of gives a really good impression of light and shadow and shade and depth and um, highlights and stuff like that. And then you exaggerate it all with the dry brush, hit those edges, and you can go in there with the washes like we did or the weathering like we did and push things even further. But the big thing I want to push is just making your model work for you. And if you, if you break the idea of it down into a shape like that, it makes it far, far, far easier. So even if our shape has really, really aggressive angles on it and it and it isn't completely round, whatever we've got going on here, like you're still gonna be able to hit upwards facing edges more easily. And then these downwards facing edges, whether it's broken down into something weird or not, you're, this is gonna be black, under here is gonna be black, under here is kind of probably gonna be gray. And that's just bearing angle in mind 
and letting the model do the work for you. So it's something I really like uh, people to think about. It's a concept that takes a little bit of getting used to, but if you imagine it as the circle or like half a circle or half a hexagon at first, that really makes a big difference in terms of kind of what you can get on your overall model. And you can take that a tiny macro, uh, sorry, micro uh, baby level, or you can do it looking at it on a much, much larger scale like we did with the Rogue Idol. And it's quite forgiving to start things like this with something like the Rogue Idol, because he's massive. It's basically like painting terrain. And I'd really recommend anyone getting hold of a model that is kind of helpful in terms of making you a little bit less precious about to try out techniques like this, because it's nice to start somewhere a bit more forgiving instead of like some pristine towel, you know, whatever. Particularly if it's the first time, then pick a helpful subject before you try a new technique. That is it. If you like the video, please give it a like. If you've got any suggestions you'd like for kind of the educational sections at the end of videos, then by all means, pop them below. Uh, Glazes has been requested and also painting terms, so they'll probably feature in a future video.